Excellent. Frank, you want to give us a little bit of a background? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm formerly of uh, Wall Street. Uh, I used to work at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, that's where I was located out of. Uh, I spent some time down in D.C. Uh, I've been investing in uh, commercial real estate. I started about 24 years ago. Um, if, while I was still on Wall Street, uh, shortly there after my career at the Fed uh, ended, I went over to J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and then I left, I was only there for a little while, and I left there about 21 years ago, uh, where I've been on my own, where I've been a full-time real estate investor. I ventured into some other things, um, owned a laundromat, um, owned a construction business uh, to somewhat vertically integrate. And uh, it's been quite a ride. Uh, absolutely love it. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. So... Um, my background is in economics. I went to law school. And um, well, as much as I am intrigued by law, I found myself thinking that I don't really want to be a lawyer. Uh, I could satisfy my quest for uh, you know, legal interest by pulling down some de decisions from the United States Supreme Court and reading through theirs and seeing how they got their analysis to their conclusions. So Yeah, scratch that itch, right? So <laughs> when, uh, you know, when I think Wall Street, at least in my economic brain, you know, it's, it's not a hand in hand thing, usually for uh, someone who is on Wall Street to end up as a real estate investor. So I think you're in this pretty unique situation with your Wall Street pedigree with your having been worked with the Federal Reserve. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to dive into how that life informed your investing uh, career and, and, you know, maybe how you got into what type of assets you did. Can you maybe speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So when I was at the Federal Reserve, the, the Federal Reserve is uh, basically, well, I mean, besides, of course, being the central bank, uh, each local district has various divisions. And there's a division such as, you know, operations, which is like cash management. There's obviously the, um, the overmarket uh, committee, which does the day-to-day -day, uh, trading, into-day trading with the registered broker dealers. Uh, and then you have this broad group called bank supervision. And I was within that group um, in a small subset. Most of them are commercial bank examiners. And then there's a small sub group called Specialized Examinations and Trusts. And so I was actually in the trust world, uh, but it was very unique uh, in that most of what we did, we looked into uh, and dealt with some special situations, uh, and I could only pass it along as that. Uh, when banks dealt with where they were in the position of a, of a fiduciary, of a fiduciary on behalf of wealthy clients. Mm -hmm. um, there were some other things as well outside of that, like for, for example, like operations at uh, DTC, which is a depository trust company, which is where all the shares of all the stock that gets traded is held. Mm -hmm. So there's um, counterparty analysis that goes on uh, when you're trading with somebody in case of what happens if they default on the counter side. And then there's systemic risk within the banking industry. So it really, um, it was quite exciting work and I absolutely loved it. Um, it, it. It was, and I feel very fortunate to have, you know, been within that group uh, because there are certainly a lot of wonderful people that I worked with. But on the fiduciary side, within the banking side, um, one of my specialties was asset management because I was a former investment advisor uh, in a very small boutique firm prior to my entry into the Federal Reserve. And w it's within there that I sort of um, found that high net worth individuals are not common, are not commonly uh, known, nor are they of the people that you may think that they are. Like for example, they're not the Madonnas and the Michael Jordans of the world. Um, although they're certainly within that group, 
uh, a lot of them are just simply small business owners that absolutely loved what they did. And part of being a business owner uh, in their asset world of what they had insofar as their wealth, commercial real estate was a cornerstone mm. of that wealth. Mm. So that's where I saw this pattern, which ironically enough, uh, about two or three years after I discovered it, uh, Tom, Tom, uh, Thomas Stanley, uh, or Stanley Thomas, I always get that mixed up, came out with his book that he co-wrote with someone else uh, called The Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely fascinated with that book. I, I think it's a must read for anybody who wants to really get a, a grasp on what millionaires are really like. And um, it's exactly what I was seeing. And shortly after reading that book, uh, someone passed along to me a book that's known a little bit more, although not too much. Um, it's, you know, a lot of people just don't know about it. It's, it's called um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, <laughs> oh, maybe that one? Of you, just that? Yeah, Never heard maybe of it. some of you heard of that one? Yeah, that uh, one? Yeah, and yeah. that book, when I got done reading that book, I immediately sprung into action and I bought an eight family uh, garden apartment complex a few months after that, mm -hmm. and I've never looked back. Awesome. Um, so, kind of what I hear you saying is you saw that these high net worth individuals really had some sort of commercial real estate, and then you did kind of the appropriate learning in the interim, and that put you into action, which actually kind of speaks to something that I read that, that put me into action, that if you look at the 1%, some ridiculous figure of them, like north of 80% are became wealthy because of a real estate investment. So, I mm -hmm. like how you backed into that idea. So, yep, uh, and, 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 and I would just clarify that I really didn't do that much education on the <laughs> commercial real estate side, um, because being on Wall Street, you walk around, you know, you, you know, you hear a bunch of things. So there's a guy by the name of George Soros, uh, which maybe some of you have heard of, maybe you haven't. Um, I don't really like to mention his name because he's, he could be a little bit of a hot potato politically. Uh, and, and some people will, like, oh God, you know, whatever. Uh, but he, he ran the quantum fund and he was very successful at what he did without any question. And I was uh, listening to him speak once, and he said that when he comes to analyzing investments, if he likes an investment, he'll jump in with both feet. If it mm. doesn't work out, he could always pull a foot out later. And that was, that was just the deer in the headlight moment for me. Yeah. And I saw this eight family, ran the numbers, obviously a numbers guy, uh, made sense, jumped in with both feet. Figured yeah, ready, out, fire, eight, make yep, it happen. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> I absolutely. love it. So I happen to kind of know where you're at in your, we've, we've spoken about it at length before. So I know that you are not an active buyer right now, but if you were given the state of everything you see, what sort of assets would you be looking to purchase if you were a buyer? If I was the buyer, I would definitely stay in the um, apartment world. Uh, I'm an apartment guy. Um, residential, you know, commercial. I sometimes claim it as commercial real estate, and it is commercial real estate. Um, but commercial real estate obviously has a bunch of different facets to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there could be industrial, there could be office, there could be medical, there could be special use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I simply focus on multifamily. Mm -hmm. That's my world. That's what I know. That's what I stay in. Uh, and we and picked I love the it. right guy to be our speaker here. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Yeah. You know, I think you're in good company because that, that's why, you know, people need a place to live. And if you choose a place with, uh, you know, good growth, it's going to, the tide will carry you, right? Exactly. Um, I'm interested to know, you know, in terms of economically speaking, our current situation you know, with what, you know, we haven't ever seen QE quantitative easing or, you know, let alone QE3 ever before. In terms of, you know, the short term and the long term effects that you could possibly see, kind of keeping an eye on multifamily investing, you know, wh what do you think current state has uh, done to our investment vehicle of choice? 
I th there's lots of different facets to that question. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, I think, um, I think it's important to be cognizant of the fact that there's a strong shift going on in the market right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that is happening as a result of political unrest or, or maybe not political unrest, but certainly uh, political pressures. Um, so I think, generally speaking, you're going to see a migration. You're seeing it actually now, the numbers, you know, correlate to this. You're seeing a mass migration out of urban cities. So in the multifamily space, you know, you've had this gentrification play going on for the past 10 years, 20 years, uh, maybe even longer. Um, and that is all, I think, stopped in my mm -hmm. opinion and i don't think that we're going to go back there uh on two for, for two reasons one what's going on in the inner cities which is horrific and then two it's a function of being safe because people have been scared to death literally uh with this COVID 19 uh a lot of people are not paranoid but certainly concerned about their well-being maybe some aren't whatever but nevertheless i think we're going to see a d uh we're going to see a lessening of intensity from a planning standpoint uh mm. i'm a former chair of a planning board so uh intensity means you know more people packed on top of one another less intensity means you know uh, less people so I, I think there's going to be a migration flow uh of people seeking areas where they have some grass, they have some space in between them. Mm -hmm. So in the multifamily space, I think um, high rise buildings may not fare as well, relatively speaking to say a garden apartment complex where you may have your individual uh, uh, access and egress you know, to and from your own unit without getting into a common area, such as in a high rise in an elevator, you can't escape mm -hmm. it, right? So, and I think there's going to be a flow towards some markets, um, like in Idaho, for example, uh, places where previously they may not have been thought of as right. a place to invest in multifamily because of lack of population. But I think you're going to see that migratory flow. Right. That's on one side. On the second side with easing, uh, clearly, we've seen interest rate drop, and as interest rates uh, fall, you know, you see a rise in multifamily pricing and even real mm -hmm. estate pricing. Uh, prices of, of housing has gone up, um, generally speaking. Uh, there's that inverse relationship. But as the money continues to be pushed into the economy, you can't help think from a broader perspective, what happens, what are the consequences of, of spending? And some numbers that I've heard um, are that we're now printing over 50 cents. We're, spend, we're printing and spending over 50 cents of every dollar that we, of over what we take in. Wow. So how long does that last? How long right. does that go on? Uh, and what does that look like? So, and this is where you get into the, where you get into the heady um, economist think type. Reserve um, currency situations. Areas. Yeah. Exactly. And this is a little bit removed from more specifically multifamily. This is more broad. And um, we can get into that, but there's, there's, there's some thoughts. I think there's a general school of thought that's uh, concerned about the, about uh, hyperinflation if the mm -hmm. dollar was to lose its reserve currency and you right. uh oh <laughs> is it just frank <laughs> is it just me there and there he is welcome back okay so <laughs> yeah. I... no hyperinflation reserve currency and i'll tell you like i do kind of in the the last bit of our talk here i want to get into what you think future state will be so i would love to okay. dig into that but sure. in terms of you know current situation you did mention political unrest and i think that that's 
I mean, clear. And I think that, you know, maybe deserves like your thoughts around not anyone's political leanings or anything like that, but, you know, the economy will respond differently given which candidate wins, right? So if you could maybe walk us through your thoughts on what might happen to multifamily and lending, should one candidate win and then should the other candidate win? Meaning just political party, not, not the... Right. I, th I think that there's significant risk in the multifamily space as a result of where we're going as a country. So notwithstanding whether an R or a D gets elected, I think that the country, generally speaking, is moving towards and wanting, or, or, or the loud calling that we're hearing is a push towards socialism. Now, a lot of people think that we live in a capitalist society. We don't. Sorry, I have news for you. We're not a capitalist society. As much as we like to brag that we are, we're not. There's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of oversight, there's a lot of government. And I only see more of that happening because there's a cry and there's an expectation that people want assistance and people want help. Again, generally speaking, maybe not you individually, but generally speaking, of course. Well, given the that then is Section 8 the play? Is that what you're, is maybe that? Well, well, Section 8 could be the play, but then of course it could come with, um, with some regulatory risk. Like for example, we've seen that uh, there's a stay on evictions should the property uh, receive any sort of government assistance. Mm -hmm. So if you have a Section 8 tenant uh, under normal circumstances or what happened in the past, uh, you, you, you can evict, um, even here in New Jersey, which is where I'm located, and um, you, you could evict if they don't pay their portion of the rent. Uh, and then, you know, they're supposed to be kicked off the program uh, if that happens. Uh, it, and then there's an appeal for that and it doesn't normally happen, but whatever. Um, but now, it, depending upon what portion is coming from the government and what portion they're receiving or they're supposed to pay, what does that look like? And your total number of units, what does that do to your bottom line? If in the example, you know, X percentage of your Section 8 tenants do not pay. Mm. And moreover, if they're not paying and you can't evict them, because there's a federal rule, uh, because the people in power uh, agree with some of the, the people who are clamoring about that, you know, rent is a basic right. Right. What does that look like? I don't know. It's very difficult. Yeah. I don't think we, you know, I, my crystal ball is broken. Yeah, but I, I'll tell you, like, I... It is an interesting thing to hear. I have a friend who's actually joined us from Silicon Valley who, you know, California is doing some things to forgive rent. You know, what happens to landlords there? It's, it will, I guess, you know, we'll just kind of have to stay tuned. Um, yeah. I do want to dig into this idea behind reserve currency because, um, you know, we're, as Americans, getting away with murder. We can print as much money as we want, inflate away, do whatever we need. And in my opinion, the reason I like hard assets and locking in good long-term debt is uh, because go ahead, inflate it away. It'll be it'll be great for my business plan. But what happens if we are seen as irresponsible and lose that spot as reserve currency? So, in your opinion, what happens to multifamily as an asset class and lending around that if we can't bank on being able to uh, print money? If we lose status of the reserve currency, uh, and we've certainly been ab abusive with uh, having a fiat currency. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, we're, we're not backed by gold. We haven't been for a long time. Uh, people blame Nixon, but we've wandered off the gold standard a long time before then. Nixon just did the official act of closing the window. Um, and 
in that time, uh, if, if we, we've continued to print money and we've continued to run, uh, not to have anyone feel any sort of pain during any economic downturn, should it lose the reserve currency and there's the whole world on debate on how you, that, that may or may not happen and what happens in that case, where would they go? People talk about a gold standard or whatever. Um, the, in the case, if that happens and we have inflation and a rampant uh, rise of cost of goods and products and services, um, people talk about going to the gold standard. Um, that may or may not happen. Uh, I don't know. I don't think he, I don't think we're ready yet to go into a McDonald's and pay for a Happy Meal with some gold nuggets, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think we would go to a bartering situation, uh, which is typically what happens. It happened in Russia back in 1991, after the Berlin Wall came down and money was useless over there. Mm -hmm. uh, people people were paying for services with Marlboro cigarettes, for example, and Levi jeans, Ray, uh, you know. Uh, Ray-Ban sunglasses were commodities over there that you could trade with. So that's what we see in that sort of collapse of an economy. Generally speaking, hard assets do thrive in that sort of thing because it's land. Right. Uh, but then you have the, the, the counter effect of, well, that's great if you have the land, it's going up in value, but how valuable is it if your apartment building is empty or right. your apartment building is, is, has a bunch of people in it that are not paying their rent. Right. It becomes like a yield play, but can whoever lives you know, that's paying that rent, I mean, how far do Ray-Ban sunglasses to feed your kids go to feed your kids? <laughs> you know? Right. So yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting, um, I, I mean, that seems so like 1984, Ian Rand, pie in the sky, but how, like if you're a betting guy, you know, one to 10, what's the likelihood of a collapse of an economy like that happening and us losing reserve currency? You know, where do you, where do you put your chips? Under normal circumstances and for a very long time, I would probably say that it would have been at like a, at our zero to two range, depending upon what was going on. And, the, and for the most part, I don't really follow politics that much anymore. Uh, Mandy, as you know, uh, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm still, but, you know, you, you train to look at long-term um, or I'm trained, an economist is basically trained to, you, in order to somewhat, with some, some level of confidence of predicting where the future will go, you have to establish long-term trends. Mm -hmm. And what's a long-term trend? A long-term trend is that we're our, you know, ludging forward towards, towards uh, a socialist country. Uh, we, we don't produce that much here in this country anymore. We, I've, I was shocked to find that IV fluid, when the COVID-19 broke out, we only had one factory making it and it was in Puerto Rico and it was down. The rest of it was coming from China. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what sort of migratory s switch will go on with how things are being produced. Um, Meaning you think more things will be American made. Is that, did I gather your thoughts correctly? It, 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 they, I, I think there's a very strong case that they should be. Mm -hmm. And if we become more independent, more self reliant, which hopefully is something that we will see if the people will recognize coming out of this. Uh, but in doing so, to get back to your question, where the reserve currency, what's that look like? I, I do think that there will be some sort of pullback because I think at the end of the day, all politics is local. Mm -hmm. And I think other countries are going to start looking to fend for themselves. I think America has gotten away with a lot over the years um, and being fiscally irresponsible. Are there other countries that are more fiscally irresponsible than we are? Yes. <laughs> Greece. Did, did, did they, yeah, Greece is one, Japan is another, you know, but by, by levels of debt versus GDP, right? Mm -hmm. However, how you want to, but you know, that's Greece and that's Japan. Japan's an island, you know, not to deminimize Japan, but it relative to the United States. Right. And, and, and how other countries look at us to be a superpower, to act as 
you know, they, they want, they want America in a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I was formerly married to someone who came from Europe and there's this thing about, you know, America being the world police, but we often get pulled in because it's not like that we look to be the, the world's policemen. We get pulled into that role. But back to your point, or if I was to, th- my number being a zero to two, depending upon what had happened in the past, uh, I am probably now at a four to a five because I do think that there's going to be a pullback uh, of other countries, whether it's um, whether it's the EU as a block or if the mm-hmm. EU comes apart, um, which has long been my thought. Uh, I, never, I never saw the United States of Europe. <laughs> ah, that's but, great. But, but, this is, so, but this goes back to us debating about it back in the day in yeah, the versus, 90s before it happened. Right. But. So we, we went through a little bit of, you know, current state stuff. Well, um, take out that crystal ball of yours, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, we're, tell us, you know, in terms of, you know, fiscal policy that you potentially see, we kind of went into that with the... Uh, um, you know, people wanting things, the, you know, potential move towards socialism. What do you think that will end up doing to, you know, in the, not the long, long term, but maybe let's say shorter to middle term? Uh, what does that do to asset, asset pricing and cap rates and, and lending that's available to be ascertained for these multifamily assets? I think it's going to be dependent upon the state, um, but wherever where you're operating, um, I, th- I think I think the biggest risk that most people don't account for when they're looking at multifamily is the regulatory risk, mm. and you, I think you're going to see a greater push uh, by government on property owners, you know, the evil landlords, a term which I very rarely use because I actually disdain the term. Uh, it's such a medieval term. Uh, I was once in court as a quick side story, and I quick to the judge because he asked me if I was a landlord. I said, no, I'm a property owner. I don't tax the residents who live on my property on their harvests of potatoes. And he chuckled, of course. Uh, and it was a light moment in the courthouse. But that aside, um, I think there's going to be a stronger regulatory risk. And you, we see this all the time. Here in New Jersey, uh, for example, I, put, I wrote an article for the Bigger Pockets about staying informed locally because it was a city that wanted to impose uh, to keep their residents safe. Normally that would be a function of police powers, uh, but they wanted to push it onto property owners and the, uh, the legislation that was introduced was to have security guards on site for any property that had more than X amount of residents or X amount of units. Mm. Now that may may and it may not be something, but if you think about armed personnel or trained security personnel, because you need to have trained, otherwise you're opening yourself up to litigation risk. Uh, But if you wanna have armed and trained, oh, I'm sorry, I think there was, uh, it, it had to be armed. So you, you, you start pulling off the numbers of what that costs and what that looks like. Now you're imposing like a fifty thousand uh, dollar, fifty to seventy five thousand dollar tax on unfunded tax on property owners in mm-hmm. that city. That's interesting. So I mean, basically, what I'm hearing you say uh, is, from the beginning, we were saying high rise apartments are scary, which I totally agree with. I'm seeing. You know, I can't sell a condo in Chicago to save my life, but these, you know, suburban houses are flying off the shelves here. Yep. So we're seeing that happen real time. So, you know, maybe secondary tertiary markets are ideal. And, you know, in this, reg- I'm interested to know from regulatory risk, what do you, what would you do to hedge that bet? Or, or can you? Uh, it, it's not something that you can hedge but you in a way you can if you were to go to a less dense area in a more Mm. in a in a friendlier state so to speak um where 
they would like to see um, some growth, some economic growth. Uh, and, and there are municipalities out there that, that do want to have that. Uh, and that's all around the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in Italy, it's famous, it's well known that they sell uh, old homes. For, they were, some governments are willing to sell a home for one euro. It happens in Just, Michigan too. It does it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't be interested in moving to Michigan. Uh, I'm, I'm more set on Italy, but, <laughs> uh, but, but nevertheless, um, some municipalities uh, welcome that development and growth and want to expand their population. And I think in those sorts of markets, um, you, you might be able to uh, fare better as compared to a larger uh, market where there's more people and, and, and greater density. Mm. Uh, w- but again, there, the, the thing there is that there's a flight. I mean, this is history repeating itself. So uh, I don't know the average age of the population here on this call, but um, I was very young. But nevertheless, I do remember when, uh, again, I'm here in New Jersey, there, we had race riots back in the 60s. I was a very young boy and I happened to be in the back of my father's car bouncing around from the floorboards to the seat, no car seats back then, no seat belts, and I was with my sister. And we were driving, uh, not to Newark, but we were driving in that direction, and we were stopped by the National Guard. And I remember that because I used to play with G.I. Joes. Um, you know, what a wild thought, a young boy playing with G.I. Joes back in right. the day, right? But, um, the, the, uh, but they were, no, no, nevertheless, there was a National Guard member there in full you know, green fatigues uh, or, you know, green uh, uh, utilities on. And we, we couldn't get through so, to get through the car dealer. And, so we had to turn around and go back. And, and, you know, and then that started an economic phenomenon of, you know, white flight, suburbial sprawl mm-hmm. and all that other jazz. And that's, there's, there's white papers. If you're interested in putting yourself to sleep, there's a whole bunch of white papers out there written by economists that, that delve into that. Very interesting, I find. But Nevertheless, you're seeing that all over again awesome. because people yeah. want to be safe and they want to be safe from someone sneezing in the same building. Yeah. <laughs> and they also want to be safe from um, riots. Of, of, of riots and, and, yeah. and, and not seeing, um, you know, people use drugs and so forth and what have you in the streets. And that's, by the way, I'm in the shadows of New York City. Yeah. New York City is literally right across the bay from me. Um, and that's what you're seeing. And I, well, I don't want to sound like a word, you know, I don't want to sound pessimistic or whatever, right. but there, I was just having this conversation the other, uh, last week with somebody who knows some building owners in New York city and they were millionaires and they're going to be filing for bankruptcy. I'm sure. Well, I mean, I, I tell you what, I, I mean, I've had troubles with these primary markets for some time. So I, well, you're talking to a girl who invested in a building in Kenosha, Wisconsin, thinking it was a really awesome tertiary market. So big high five to me on that one. But uh, what I'm kind of hearing you as a little wrap up here is you want, you know, I, my notes for how I'm going to inform my vet investing based off our conversation are I want landlord friendly, I want secondary or tertiary markets, and I, I want smaller properties. So I am, I'm super grateful for this conversation, Frank. Um, my co-host, do you have any questions maybe to rapid fire here before we um, toss over to our networking portion? Yeah, we had a couple of questions come in that I can uh, address real quick. And guys, if anybody else has questions, feel free to message Kevin or I or just throw them in the chat box. Um, but Frank, we talked about, or you talked about interest rates earlier briefly. You know, given the state of the economy and where things are at, would you expect rates to stay where they are over the next couple of years? Like, what do you think the next step for the Fed to be as far as when they might actually come in and raise rates? In my opinion, they will keep rates as low as possible. If they start to raise the rates, then the federal government's going to have to pay a lot more in interest, and they can't do that. So the interest rate uh, has the interest rates have been declining for years. When I first got into the business, uh, commercial uh, interest rates were uh, typically nine, ten percent. Right now in today's market, are you more of a fan of stabilized or value add opportunities? 
stabilized, I want cash flow from day one. Cash on cash return is my number one analytical tool. I don't care about anything else. Anything else could be um, sugared and powdered to make it look attractive. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen the shift in people wanting more stabilized properties right now because it's hard to know what you can rent a unit for after you rehab it in 12 to 18 months. It's just too hard to predict those rents going forward. Yep. Um, if you were starting out today and looking to acquire your first property, what advice would you give to somebody looking to start out today? First and foremost, broadly, I think that generally speaking, Americans are not in good financial condition. So I would say make sure your financial house is in order. Um, make your balance sheet as strong as possible. Uh, be Put yourself in the best possible position. Um, having said that, I would look into markets that are, as I mentioned, that are not only friendly, uh, small, good mix of people, uh, stable, um, you know, where they're, where the tenant's income is coming from. Uh, like, for example, I happen to like Florida. I was looking into Florida for a while. I was looking into a market, though, that I had some reservations about, and I never bought. And fortunately, I didn't because the area that I was looking into, well, as much as I liked it for a rental market, was predominantly built on tourism and uh, socializing, bars, clubs, et cetera. So um, I wouldn't be interested in something like that. Another one that came in was with all the money being printed currently, what is your opinion on future asset inflation? So when you have uh, a lot of printing of money, you, have, you run the risk of uh, you know, devaluing the currency and you're getting into hyperinflation. And there's, there's a ton of books out there if you're interested in you know, continuing on learning that. Um, and, and hyperinflation, though, uh, again, hard assets do tend to hold their value but, uh, or, or rise in value. Uh, real estate rose dramatically during uh, the 70s where we had some really uh, strong pushes, you know, cost push inflation, uh, you know, with, you know, because we had Nixon with hyper, uh, we had Nixon with wage and price controls, and then we followed up by Carter by expansionary fiscal policy with, uh, an, expansion, with an expansionary uh, monetary policy at the Fed. Uh, with, you know, the Phillips curve and, you know, the misery index and stagflation and all that jazz. Uh, just, bear mi just bear in mind, though, that although the asset could be rising in value, um, it's, the, it, it's holding on to it. It's, it's, it's having the ability to hold on to it. And the ability to hold on to it is going to be determined based upon how well you purchase it, how well, how stable it is, and how low your leverage is. So uh, Mandy already knows this, but my portfolio, I only have leverage on it at about 40%, 45%. Uh, and I uh, had one property with a partner and it became somewhat um, destabilized as a result of us going back and forth and not being done, anything being done to the property. But I was able to get to, uh, I had a 45%, 43% uh, vacancy at one point with a bunch of units empty and it was still positively cash flowing. So that's the type of property that I would be very comfortable on going forward because I know I can weather whatever storm is going to be thrown at me. Yeah. Uh, we've all heard about a lot of money sitting on the sidelines right now. What do you think the impact of that is on the markets? Uh, there's it, the, the amount of money sitting on the sideline is just, um, just reflects what we all know. There's uncertainty. There's uncertainty with the election. There's uncertainty where this country is going. There's uncertainty with COVID-19. There's uncertainty to what, what our future looks like. And there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of hand wringing going on at the moment. So it doesn't surprise me that there's a bunch of money sitting on the sidelines. I think money will come off the sidelines uh, if there's a good case uh, for an asset to be purchased, multifamily assets to be purchased. 
uh, that can that that shows good cash on cash return from day one, and um, it is well poised so that even if there is some sort of uncertainty going forward and there might be some waves, you know, with the political front and the regulatory risk and and et cetera, as we discussed previously, I think um, I think people will uh, step. They'll be smart to come off the sidelines and and purchase. I think some multifamily asset in some markets um some people think that there's a fire sale going on and and people have, have been looking for a buying opportunity i don't think we're there yet i think the, i think a, by and large a majority of the mark a majority of the assets that are being uh marketed are still very close to full value um without that much of a of a great deal uh, and I think the last question we have is, what are your thoughts on vacation rental markets? Do you see those rebounding, and uh, is that a good investment right now? I would shy away from it personally. Um, I don't think, because of the comment that I mentioned earlier, where uh, I've seen some numbers where uh, over 50% of the population cannot put their hands on $1,000 in an emergency situation. Uh, and I think I would hold off until the stimulus money uh, stops because I think that's going to be a true uh, unveiling of, of of what state we're in as a country uh, without the you know six hundred dollars per week or whatever what people are getting. I, I don't know because I don't get any of that stuff. So and I haven't applied for it or whatever the case may be. So whatever what people are getting insofar as financial stimulus or insofar as forbearance is concerned would help. I think all that needs to stop and I think all that need uh, and all that needs to unravel and then you're going to see um, who's standing and who isn't. And depending upon um, what that looks like, that will determine whether or not people have disposable income to go to some vacation rental and and you know join in an Airbnb. Yeah. Just my thoughts. Okay. No, it's uh, great feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're good with the Q and A. Uh, Kevin, was there anything else that I missed? No, you pretty much covered a lot of great questions. So once again, a um, big thing to keep in mind here is to really formulate your investment thesis um, going forward. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market and you know, as Frank mentioned, there's a, a lot of money on the sidelines because of that uncertainty. Um, one thing that really resonated is like invest in something that's actually producing. So cash on cash, make sure that it's, if you do buy anything right now, that it's generating income and that it can weather a storm, you're not over leveraged. So, um, any other items, Mandy, Brian, before we break out into the, the networking event or networking portion? No, Frank, you, thank you so much for joining us. This was, this was huge. Thank you for having me. I totally enjoyed it. Hopefully you got some value out of this. Uh, I didn't scare you because that wasn't my intention, but uh, a, a good smart buyer going forward, I think um, will will do well in the long term. 100%. Awesome. So.